This special report brought to you by NASA. Thank you for that applause, and welcome to NASA headquarters in Washington, D.C. We are live inside the Webb Auditorium to celebrate the NASA worm, one of the world's most iconic symbols. You can see it here behind me. It is a sleek, simple design, NASA, styled in a bold, unique type. It first debuted in 1976 and then was retired in 1992, but now it is back supporting NASA's main insignia, commonly referred to as the meatball. Today, we will hear opening remarks from NASA communications experts, followed by a panel discussion, and one of those panelists is actually the designer and creator of the worm. We will learn the history of its creation, why it went away for almost 30 years, and why it's back, and also why our agency and the public love it. So without further ado, I'd like to invite Mark Etkind to the stage, the Associate Administrator of NASA's Office of Communications. Thanks, Megan, and thanks all for joining us today. Uh, it's not often that I get to undress in public, so uh, <laughs> just indulge me for a brief moment. Yeah, yeah, there you go, there you go. <laughs> yes, thank you. This NASA logo, this NASA logo is a beacon that shines across the globe as a celebration of human achievement. And it's safe to say that the worm is one of the most powerful insignias in the world representing ingenuity, exploration, possibilities, and the best of what America can accomplish. The NASA worm was born of the Federal Design and Improvement Program and designed by Richard Daney. Thank you, Richard, for joining us today. It was, it was introduced in 1976 and retired in 1992. But at NASA, we don't let great things go to waste. So we brought it back in 2020 to live aside the primary logo, the meatball. Since its historic launch, the worm logo type has resurfaced on signage, spacecraft, space shoots, uh, shirts worldwide. Um, a NASA worm sculpture sits outside our brand new Earth Information Center at headquarters. Uh, the worm marked the return of the American human spaceflight on American rockets from American soil. The worm helped us usher in Artemis I and will be with us as we return to the moon. At NASA, we're constantly telling the stories of human achievement because when we do that, we inspire the next generation of innovators and explorers, the Artemis generation. And whenever the Artemis generation sees the worm, they will be reminded that the missions of tomorrow will be sparked by their accomplishments today. Thank you, Richard, for this remarkable symbol. Thank you, Mark. Uh, as he said, the worm officially wriggled itself out of retirement starting in 2020. And the lead designer behind that reintroduction was David Rager. He's also here today. And let's invite him up to the stage. He's NASA's creative director. Thank you. I'm David Rager. I'm NASA's creative director. And as design lead across the agency, I help develop and manage NASA's brand. I'm fortunate to be part of the team that brought back the 1976 NASA logo type, working with its creator, Richard Daney. And before I share a few words about that, I, there are two words for any of you guys tuning at home, tuning at home right now that you're going to hear a lot today, and they are worm, and that's what we affectionately call the NASA logo type. And this is the NASA insignia, also known as the meatball. And the meatball was created in 1959 after NACA became NASA, and its legacy was solidified through our early and remarkable accomplishments, including the Apollo missions. And on January 1st, 1976, NASA adopted the worm as its primary identifier. Designed by Richard Daney and Bruce Blackburn, a continuously flowing line conveyed a sense of modernity, progress, and propulsion. And it was supported by a new graphic standards manual, essentially a how-to book for the brand. And their new design program was well documented, accessible, and provided endless examples of the new logo in use. And importantly, they partnered with internal creative staff like Bob Schulman to help turn an idea into reality together. 
course, redesigning anything with so much emotional resonance can be tricky. And there certainly were some camps, meatball fans and warm lovers. And in 1992, the NASA logo type was retired and the insignia was reinstated as our official logo. Almost 30 years later, the worm got a second life on the Demo 2 mission. And from there, we looked to see how these two incredible logos could coexist harmoniously. Aesthetically, some might say they come from different planets, but we found with just the right balance, they complement each other fantastically. And on aircraft, we placed the meatball near the crew towards the front of the craft. And the worm rests on the larger surface for support and legibility. And on our space launch system, the insignia is placed up near the crew and the worm large and bold on the boosters. And of course, on transportation vehicles on the pad, the supersized worm became the python. <laughs> we also updated our graphic standards manual to align everything and have been gradually implementing it over the past few years. And that can be seen on places like our buildings, and our spacecraft. This is a selfie that Orion took on its recent trip around the moon with all of us photobombing in the background. And we began to roll it out on our broadcast packages. The rigorous practice of design documentation continues to be a priority at NASA today. And here's a look behind the scenes at our New Horizon design system. and some examples of it in use on our new website, which is at nasa.gov. Of course, beyond our walls, the public has been incredibly receptive and supportive. Our, merchandi our merchandising office receives hundreds of requests every week, underscoring NASA's enduring influence. You know, and both these marks have made an impact, and they really show how NASA endures as a symbol of something that's larger than us all. I'm certainly thankful for the foresight that NASA had five decades ago to collaborate with such a thoughtful and talented designer to help us shape that symbol. Thank you so much, Richard. Yes, thank you, Richard, and also thank you, David. Uh, it was really interesting to hear uh, the thought behind the placement and the usage of our beloved worm again. Now it's time for our panel, so we'd like to start welcoming our guests up to the stage now. Moderating today will be Shelley Tan, graphics uh, reporter at the Washington Post, and joining her on stage will be Richard Daney, designer and creator of the NASA worm. We also have Michael Barut, designer at Pentagram. Bert Ulrich, entertainment and branding liaison here at NASA and Julia Heiser, artist merchandise at Amazon Music. Thank you all for being here, and we look forward to your discussion. Thank you, Megan, for that lovely introduction. Um, like she said earlier, my name is Shelley Tan. I'll be your moderator today. Um, our panel today is going to talk a bit about the start and evolution of the worm, uh, its impact on the design world, as well as, it, uh, well, as well as its diffusion into the popular imagination and popular culture. Um, so without further ado, let's, uh, let's kind of set the stage for how the start of this whole story goes, right? Um, it's 1974. Uh, President Nixon and the NEA, the National Endowment for the Arts, have kickstarted a federal program to basically revamp the design identities of 40 plus federal agencies. And this is where you, Richard, um, you and Bruce Blackburn at the time received this request to submit a redesign proposal for NASA. Um, walk us through how this all starts and, and your thought process as everything evolves. Well, it kind of starts with a huge shock and surprise. And in, in, we received an RFP. Our firm was about a year old. And uh, Bruce, uh, may he rest in peace, was very involved in uh, federal things before it. Shamar from Geismar, where he is a partner. Uh, so he had designed the American Bicentennial symbol. And we think that's one of the reasons that we got invited. A uh, firm of five people, really tiny. Um, and all of a sudden, this RP drops out of nowhere, um, and we're thrilled. And uh, we have to uh, about a week to respond. And, and it's, it's ironically, it's a, a verbal proposal. You know, there are no visuals or anything to go with it. It's just a written proposal, and uh, it's submitted about a week later. And um, then maybe they took 
another two weeks or something like that, and then they dropped a bomb on us. So we were selected to do it. Uh, stunned and uh, thrilled, as Michael's been through this before with me, and I'm so grateful he's sitting here today. Uh, and anyway, so we have about a month or two to pull the whole thing together. I, I, I think one of the most interesting things about it, I was talking to some friends from Pentagram earlier, the, uh, we decided to, to propose one symbol, one, only one, and uh, support it with about 25 demonstrations. Now that was radical then and it's radical now. Uh, but we did it and it worked. Uh, it was approved in about a week by the same people that were in the room the day we presented it on the slide projector. And um, then we, that, would, that all happened in July and in, by October we had approval. We, everybody argues about when it was, came to market, so to speak. It was actually 75, not 76. But the manual itself, which was a, a really neat document, uh, has uh, January 1st, 1976 in it. And that's when Dr. Fletcher wrote the endorsement letter in it. And I think that probably is the reason for that. But we had run work workshops at NASA in, in the summer of 75. And we hired Bob, Sh we recommended hiring a graphics coordinator at that time. And they ended up picking Bob, Sh Bob Schulman. Um, Enlightened Management didn't show him the manual. He didn't see the logo, but they, he was hired. And he turned out to be a great ally and uh, a very close friend. So I, I was able to um, have a 10-year relationship with, with NASA as a design director, external design director. Very, very rewarding. Tougher, tougher hill to climb than you might think. Uh, mostly because the centers had just been pulled together in terms of NASA and they were very renegade and I likened them to unruly children. Uh, I'm sure their representatives here today and their names are back here, but, but today some of that s still exists. Uh, what it is, they're just very competitive. They're extremely good at what they do. Uh, but they're aggressive and competitive is one of the reasons they are good. And that's, that made it a, a difficult client situation. But well, we got through it. And by uh, but, but eight or 10 years later, we finished the last supplement in the manual. And, uh, and that was one of the most rewarding um, involvements in my career, for sure. Um, now, you mentioned the, the standards manual that you created as well. Um, and it seems like that was a really important part of uh, educating kind of uh, people at NASA, the, you know, this federal agency that maybe hadn't had much experience from this uh, respect before. Um, can you talk a little bit about creating that design culture at NASA? It, it was a fairly slow process, mostly because they were so independent, which is really an asset, I think, and, and, and makes them better. Um, but there was resistance, to, understandably, I think, to anything coming out of headquarters. And so, ironically, I think the designers of this program got to be the liaison with the centers. I mean, in other words, we were sort of sent out there to take the heat and, uh, and uh, experience any negative stuff that might be coming out. But then we would make the point that it's all for the greater good and that because we were bringing all of them into one matrix, uh, the national uh, matrix, and, and, but one core uh, center, and that would be headquarters. So uh, we had to make that connection. It was done in, in I think, a rather gentle way. And uh, there were some rough moments. But we finally uh, got together, and, and uh, everybody was interested in success, and, and everybody's interested in funding, and you know, the like. So. Uh, the case was made, and pretty soon the graphics themselves started showing up in public. And I think, in a way, I think the public became much more enamored of it, and that influenced the employees of NAPSA, you know, because it, Walter Cronkite was a great name in news in those days, and he loved it, and, and, he had, and the logo was behind his head, and it was just, uh, you know, it just, it took off. And as the public absorbed it and uh, became very proud of it, I think, uh, then the, the NASA employees saw some benefit to that, so it, it finally stuck.
So speaking kind of of uh, the public response as well as um, the design world response then, Michael, you yourself have a very long and storied career in design as well as a relationship with Richard. Um, can you speak a bit how uh, a bit towards how the worm might have resonated with the design world? How, how was it received? Um, Shelley, when, um, when uh, uh, Richard's um, symbol was unveiled, I was a first year student in design school. Um, at the University of Cincinnati, which is uh, uh, Richard's late partner's Bruce Blackburn's alma mater. So this idea of Danny and Blackburn having created such a significant symbol uh, was a point of school pride for my program. So we were extra aware of it. But I would also say that um, design students in those days felt that they were enlisting in this great cause, which was to modernize the world to kind of blow the dust off the, uh, the way it existed before and to kind of take it forward into an optimistic, um, you know, second half of the 20th and in, indeed in the 21st century. And this, this symbol was a beautiful demonstration of what that might look like. And so I, I would say from the minute I saw it, I understood all those things that it was meant to represent, even things that like I think, um, you know, like a normal person like my mom, who was a housewife, might say, well, why aren't there lines, horizontal lines making those A's? And I would have said, well, mom, that's supposed to look like the nose cone of a rocket ship, you know? It's modern. It's like a one sleek path, right? And um, um, it also, in, in retrospect, I realized that uh, um, it has this amazing other characteristic, which is that, to put it very simply, a uh, four-year-old can draw it. And if you're talking about seizing the imagination of the next generation, the generation after that, that sort of capacity to sort of uh, inculcate them in the excitement and to reduce it to a simple shape like that is just really thrilling. I'm not surprised that someone like news people liked it because it's just so visible and dramatic. In my business, sometimes we'll do some design and say, this is great, you'll be able to see it from a million miles away. You don't have to see many logos from a million miles away. You have to see this logo from a million miles away. And so, I, you know, it just seemed like an um, unmitigated triumph to me at the time. And I wasn't all surprised at the way it sees people's imagination. Yeah, and then to talk a little bit more about that standards manual as well then, um, of course it had that really massive Kickstarter campaign a couple years ago, raised almost a million dollars, <laughs> I believe, to, to reissue a physical copy of it. Um, it feels like it's pretty fair to say it's kind of a, a cherished icon in the design community. Yeah. Um, can, can both of you, Richard and Michael, can you talk a bit about why you think that that graphic system is, is still, you know, kind of an icon today? Um, with some hearing issues, I, <laughs> I think I know where to... Why it's sustained today? Well, this, why, this, why the system itself is so compelling? Why, why is the manual compelling to people who may not even know about graphic design? Well, I, I don't know. It, it struck a chord that I think is fairly singular. Um, the manual was, um, uh, Hamish is here today, and I gotta give him credit, Hamish and Jesse reissued our manual uh, a few years ago, and it was an enormous success. I, I think partly the way it's written, and fairly simple, straightforward language, but it's, a, it's become a cult thing, yeah. you know, with a, with a huge following. <clears throat> and um, the graphics were so thorough, it had a lot of teaching in it, Design 101, you know, I mean, it was, uh, it's everything. But then we had a lot of wonderful finished products, yeah, you know, yeah. rockets and, and space shuttles and the Hubble telescope, you know, it's sexy and, and uh, exciting for people. So to that, in that time, it was, but it still is today. Why aren't people excited about manned spaceflight? Look at the missions coming up. I mean, it, you know, everybody, it's just revved up again. And, you know, I think we're so proud that the SpaceX got involved and uh, Administrator Bridenstine, who he said that he grew up with this, this was his NASA, you know. It, it just, when they reintroduced it, and then it invigorated everything again. Uh, but I would say that through all of this, even when it was rescinded, it only got more popular. So I think, I think I said this to Michael once, maybe when you take it away, it gets more <laughs> valuable. It seems that's the way it happened. Yeah. So the point is, and 
Um, we'll be looking at this big shiny object out here a little later. But I think that's what's happened. You know, it's, uh, it's more popular today in the world than it was back then. And that's, it's hard to explain, I think, but it's just, it's what it is. So, so there's something at the core of the whole thing and the fact that I w it was serious but uh, inspirational in a way. It's hard to do with very simple things, but that's the way I've lived my life and uh, career with uh, simplicity. So it works. additional thoughts on that? Or? I just was going to say uh, when Hamish Smythe and Jesse Reed, who were uh, two young colleagues of mine, um, um, kind of came forward with this idea, we, we want to we reprint the, uh, uh, um, the standards manual. I think the appeal of it is it's sort of making public this secret source code. And people are just fascinated by that, you know, that underlying something that looks like this compelling system is are people making these decisions one by one that are all adding up to something that's more than the sum of the parts. And I think the same appeal if you watch a video of someone breaking down a music track and saying, this, this is the drums, this is the bass, this is the vocal. You know, when you see it, hear it all come together, it makes it even more magic mm -hmm. in a way. And I think, you know, there was a time where you just turned on the radio, you heard a song, you just went out and you saw a logo and you just accepted it as important people were making these things and how it happened was going to forever be a mystery. Now I think people, you know, people are able to drag and drop and pick a typeface when they uh, um, start to open a Word document. And so the idea that something is specified to the degree that this whole system was ends up being compelling and becomes a, uh, you know, a fetish object for not just designers, but I think people who care about space travel, people who care about uh, engineering. A lot of different people ended up being uh, um, interested in what that manual was and wanted to have a copy of it for themselves. Now, of course, part of the journey of the worm is uh, that moment in the 90s where it was uh, temporarily disbanded. Um, Bert, you were actually at NASA when this happened. <laughs> yes, so um, Robert Shulman, who was running the graphics program then, he came running out of his office one morning and basically said, oh my God, they're getting rid of the worm. And so he said, I have to tell Richard, I don't know how I'm gonna do this. And you know, leadership's change. And I think NASA is a very passionate place. And I think the, the meatball was very emblematic of the Apollo generation, I think, and also bringing people to the moon. And I associate also the worm with the shuttle era as well. And these are just different passions that come from different generations. The beauty of whether it went away and it came back is that now I feel like it's emblematic of, it's timeless, basically. It's not emblematic of a generation. Basically, both the worm and the meatball have a place. I think there might have been a little bit of a mistake to completely eradicate one over the other. There was a wonderful sort of sub subversive sort of cultural movement that was fomenting. I think when you guys were talking about Hamish's um, wonderful manual reissue, but also, um, we had Tom Sachs was doing artwork. There were, there were all sorts of things happening. Fashion houses started coming to us wanting to use the worm. And um, in, the, in, in sort of like 2017, Coach first came to us. And they said, we would like to do a collection with the worm. So I said, OK, I'll check with our legal office. I have the funniest feeling they're going to say no. But I went and I said, look, they're trying to do this sort of in a vintage way. And all of a sudden, the tables basically, I mean, everything sort of opened up. And they said, you can use it sort of in a vintage sort of way. So then it started sort of proliferating into pop culture, into fashion as well. Heron Preston was one uh, fashion designer that also put the worm on the map. And you ended up seeing Ariana Grande wearing it on red carpets. Um, BTS wore his clothing. And it just sort of filtered into the, in, in sort of into the popular culture in a way which was really astounding. So both logos really speak to people. I just think given the passions and leadership changes and people want to put their own you know, mark on their era of leadership, um, things just happen. But you kind of roll, go along with it. But what's nice about these, both of these logos is that they're really imprinted in the imaginations of NASA employees, the workforce, and also the public. So. Yeah, so I definitely want to talk about um, NASA's like proliferation into pop culture as well. And 
Uh, Julia, you work a lot with merchandising collaborations with NASA as well. Um, can you talk a bit about why NASA seems to be such an attractive option for this? Because um, especially, you know, it's a non-product, if you will, <laughs> compared to a lot of other brands or, or logos that we might be wearing. Yeah, I think uh, space exploration has long been a topic of conversation in the entertainment world, uh, from big blockbuster movies to the Pink Floyds and David Bowies of the world. Um, in the past five to 10 years, I think becoming a space nerd is really cool. And uh, the more we have learned about what's out there, uh, the more it's become a really big topic for artists to write songs or even whole albums about, from the Ariana Grandes to the Kid Cudi's, the Doja Cats and the Dua Lipas. And it's a very dream and whimsical, galactic, interstellar theme. Um, and artists hold a big place in being able to share that and their appreciation for it, this world bigger than them. Um, and it ties really well with their music, um, looking at artists that are sitting on a planet where there's not a lot that's bigger than them. So I think it's become a very whimsical, uh, dream big philosophy. And uh, there probably is not a day that goes by where I do not have an artist who is wanting to collaborate with NASA, whether in their music, in their exploration, or in their merchandise. And you've done amazing collaborations with us. A lot. Yeah. It's also my personal bias, yeah. ooh, sorry, and love yeah. for the NASA logo. So every time an artist has said, uh, you know, here's a name of a song or here's something I want to think about. We try to work together to make sure that when we are doing a collaboration, it's rooted in either educating around a mission, bringing um, you know, insight into something bigger as far as you know, what we're trying to get people to be inspired in space travel and space education. So it's, we always want to make sure that there's a purpose. I think one of my favorite collaborations we have done was uh, for the landing of the Perseverance rover on Mars, we worked to have my artist, uh, Dominic Harrison Youngblood, his cover of David Bowie's Life on Mars live stream over NASA TV when we landed the rover. It was one of the best days of my life. Uh, and then we launched a merch collaboration. And um, we actually. Uh, licensed all of the logos. We had some meatball logo designs, some NASA worm logo designs, the Perseverance patch. But it was such a great picture and and full circle moment. And for Youngblood, as he's talking to more of the entertainment worthy um, billboards and music charting sides of the business, it was really about him and his passion for outer space and what's out there. And I think that at its heart feels very authentic to the youth of America too. Um, and especially when it's a logo that has so much meaning behind it, they're very proud to be able to say I have earned that right to that logo. Yeah, it's amazing. Even like someone like Kid Cudi, who did probably 40 or 50 pieces of merch. For his Man on the Moon for album. Man on the Moon album. Yeah. It sort of brings the message. It's, it's really wonderful for NASA because we're able to express our message of going back to the moon in really fun, interesting ways. And they incorporate the elegance of the worm or the more wowy factor of the meatball. In, in really, really wonderful ways, so. Well, and besides the dream of it, it's one of the most aesthetically pleasing, symmetrical yes. logos there is. Um, and so for an artist to share their space on a garment or in a design, it's probably one of the most coveted ones. Um, I get asked every day, can I put that NASA logo down the sleeve? So uh, it's fun and yeah, it's been great. Yeah, I remember when we got the call, um, Bettina Inklon called me, she's here in the audience today. She called me to call Richard to tell him that they wanted to bring the worm back. I'm like, are you kidding? I was like, holy, well, I won't say it here. I'm, I won't use an expletive, but, but anyway, I was really, it was such a wonderful moment to be able to call Richard one very late one evening, I think, and told you that the worm was going to come back in yeah. some sort of shape or form to be determined by thank goodness to you and to David and Yvette Smith and Dan Goods and others to help bring it back, which was really amazing. A great experience, by the way. Yeah. It was so wonderful. What can you say? What, what was Levine that experience? Here today, I think, I hope. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so how, what, how did that feel when you got that call? Well, did you frankly, feel vindicated? Uh, <laughs> more like stunned, but, <laughs> you, know, uh, you know, thrilling. It's thrilling um, to be in purgatory for 29 years. <laughs> I, with, with, I can't say very little reason. I can't say that, can I? Uh, but, but, you know, to, to be welcomed back 
by SpaceX as a medium, and with so much success, I mean, those, those, that particular trip where they brought it back on, uh, on the rocket um, was just, uh, of course, personally rewarding, but I mean, I think it was good for the agency. And we always think of them first, you know. I, I, I would like to clarify here, you know, the firm of Daney and Blackburn did this. And even though it was tiny at the time, my partner, Bruce Blackburn, was very important to the front end. So uh, it's nice to hear you call me the creator, and I was the d design director through the whole 10-year period. But, but I want to give credit where credit is due, too. And I think that uh, th that's very important. It always has been. Human relations are, are everything. And I think our design profession is just uh, superior at that. Um, Michael is a great example of it. And what we have here today then is this generational thing where, um, you know, Hamish calls him his design father, I'm the design grandfather. <laughs> uh, that's true, I mean, I mean, he'll back it up. I don't know where he is, here, but he, that, those are his very words. Um, but anyway, so I think, you know, this phone call from Bettina was like, it, it, the heavens opened. Aww. You know, it's just a new lease on life. A kind of a, a word was used earlier, vindication. You know, that sounds negative, and I don't yeah, like no, that. Yeah. But it's rewarding. Yeah. I can't even, in words, express how rewarding it's been for this to come back. It will always be a special place in my heart for NASA. I mean, it's the place I used to come, you know, like every other week for years. And so it's my second home. And, um, you know, so all of this, the phone call, the the resurgence, the rebirth, the celebrations that have come with it today. Um, it's just uh, in your dreams. Mm -hmm. It doesn't get better than that. Yeah, and also the stars sort of aligned also with David Rigger being brought on board, yeah. first up from JPL. Oh, so I we were able to, him, you know, to really have a really asset. thoughtful way of, of bringing the worm back so that it didn't compete with the meatball. I think that was the problem because we wanted to, to keep the primary logo being the meatball because that was how it's sort of officially designated. Um, and, but at the same time, and use that as sort of like a seal and an imprint, but then have the worm basically describe in a much bigger, bolder way what the mission is about. And it does that really beautiful, whether it be on the Artemis rocket, on the Orion spacecraft, as we saw before, or, or, or basically on a, on, a, on a coffee mug. <laughs> So Bert and Michael would make good agents. I was thinking, <laughs> yeah. trying to hire them, you know, later. Yeah, and what was some of the the reaction from the public as well when when the logo was brought back, um, whether from the design world, from the rest of NASA? Um, what was some of that reaction like? So I, I saw it for sure in social media. We have an amazing social media group, and that's part of the reason we are so popular today is thanks to social media. I think because the visuals of social media really are a wonderful way to express visually what NASA is about. And of course, our logos are very much part of that. The other thing is the fashion world, quite yeah. frankly. I mean, Balenciaga started using our logos on, 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 on merch collections. We had, or fashion collections, I should say. Oh, and Dior just recently did something with us. We get, I mean, we, but then at the same time, we're like in Walmart, we're in Target. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. We don't discriminate. And we just basically, our logos are, public, are a public good for the public to be able to use in an approval sense. We don't license our logo, we don't charge for it, but we approve its use to make sure that it's hopefully being used correctly. So, yeah, I add to that? Yeah, I think to some artists, and, and it's, you want to follow the rules correctly where the logo is used as it's meant to be used. Um, it doesn't always come to fruition. We probably have as many collaborations that never saw the, the day of light as we do ones that came through. I think um, it's such an honor to be able to achieve it. And so as long as we continue thinking about it in a way that is supporting the mission of NASA and space exploration, it's, it's really interesting. I think that you will see a massive resurgence with this. I mean, I remember the day you called me before the Perseverance launch, and you're like, the, the worm's back. We can put it on logo, you know? Yeah, and I so I have a pair of socks today that are <laughs> hot pink with the worm logo up. It, I mean, it was, it was a great experience. I think oftentimes, too, from the artist world, they always want what they can't have. So knowing that there is an element of elitism to 
this logo um, and to be able to proudly be able to support it, it's fantastic. I love that you're rethinking how these licenses can be used and to continue to spread um, in the right way um, the, logo, the NASA brand and logos. I think it's important. Um, I grew up in the, the era of space exploration. I think it's a fascinating thing for, for the youth of America to be fascinated by. And there's no greater way to reach them right now than through apparel, streetwear, you know, uh, fashion, et cetera. Yeah, in our new we have a new merchandise person on board, uh, Amy Crane, and she's actually thinking in really, really bold ways to try to, to, to really sort of refashion it also visually so that we can sort of ensure that the logo is being used correctly as well. Yeah. 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 Nice. <laughs> so we're trying. Very nice. Uh, and Amy's here. Oh, pardon me. <laughs> um, Julia, you also mentioned kind of uh, when you use the logo wanting to support the mission of NASA. Um, can you tell me a bit more ab about that and, and how you go about doing that? Yeah, I think it's important we're not just driving monetary gain or music charting gain for the artist. Um, the logo should not just be put on uh, a product that has nothing to do what the music was about or what the mission was about behind the music. Um, it's not just to financially gain. So if we start with what is the right uh, song, music, title, track, tour that is leading to this. And then you have artists like Ariana Grande who literally write a song called NASA. And then we look at the design and see how does it fit in with um, what we're trying to accomplish. So it doesn't feel just hodgepodge slapped together with an artist logo or song lyrics, that the meaning of the lyrics actually, whether it be ethereal or you know subjective, kind of um, are, are thinking about the bigger picture and exploring um, something outside of us. And then I put those ideas together and pitch it to Bert and see what he thinks. And oftentimes, we're just very mindful about following all the rules. Um, making sure that we're putting logos in placements in this brand guide. I really I want to read the whole thing now, the manual. Um, but I think that's important. I think as designers and graphic designers ourselves, we love rules. Um, rules help us know how things are going to print and reflect in their final product. So, um, I, and, and it is public information. So it's something that you have an opportunity to be able to look at and see and present yourself. So yeah, I think. The thing that's so interesting, I think, about it is that, um, uh, you know, Julia, know, you know well the world of both branded merchandise and artists and designers using kind of those brands to sort of sort of manipulate the codes yes. of commercial, <laughs> the commercial world in a way, right? You can't. We can't go out and buy a NASA. You, you can't buy NASA on the shelves of a, of, a, of a grocery store. You can't go into a department store and say, show me your NASA. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's, it, it belongs to all of us because it's, it's, it it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's as, a, as a federal project, it's funded and owned by the American people, really. Yeah. And what I think makes it compelling in the ways that... Uh, um, Bert and Julie are describing to the public is the fact that this is a way to kind of show that you are kind of part of that great mission, which is kind of remarkably nonpartisan, remarkably sort of something that's perceived as uh, something that belongs to the nation in a way. So I think it's really, you know, it's it, 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 that kind of uh, um, uh, the status of that sort of entity just deserves a symbol that people can really resonate with, and that's the gift that uh, um, Richard and his firm gave us so long ago that we still are enjoying and growing with every day. Hmm. Yeah, that's also a great jumping off point then to kind of go back a little bit again to that federal program that, that really kick-started all of this. And it feels like that was a, a really important moment in at least American design history where the federal government is you know, de definitively saying, hey, good design matters, and we want to be aligned with that. Um, how did that come about? Like, what, how, what was your experience like with that from a federal level? Well, it's one of the great lessons, I think, uh, that we can all learn from. In other words, it takes one person, and in this case, it was Nancy Hanks who, who, who uh, led NEA, and she instituted the Federal Graphics Improvement Program. So one person. And she was very passionate, she was very smart. And then 
One of her subordinates was Jerry Perlmutter, who was the best drum beater I think I've ever met. And so she put him on the assignment, and uh, they decided that, that, as was appropriate, that, that we were way behind Europe and, and other people in design for federal agencies, and let's do something about it. It was very rich terrain to be cultivating, and uh, so they just put wheels under the whole thing. They started doing evaluations of the agencies, uh, audits, and most of it was just terrible, you know. Let's say garbage. And, uh, it, you know, but then, then, then they put a structure to the whole thing, you know, and they would talk to, to the leadership of the agency, and then they would convince them that they needed to do stage one, would just be exploratory design. Did they need help? And, of course, they all did. Uh, but but her, um, her message was so clear and strong that all the agencies kind of fell in line. And the interesting thing about NASA was they... They thought if they could get a, a win with NASA, probably the others would fall into line and do it, because they were very hesitant, you know, there was a lot of reluctance. And it was true, and so we did start the NASA thing, and we got an early win, and it was like dominoes. And uh, so here was this virgin territory where so much work needed to be done, and uh, as I mentioned, before, or I don't know that I specified it, but the next, it led us to do the Department of Transportation, which was a humongous job, you know, just enormous. And then out of that, FAA, Federal Aviation, and then finally U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, and this is, my hair turned gray in that period, and, <laughs> and, and it fell out. But uh, the reality is there was this great need and I think there was a momentum. The most elegant part of this whole thing that was started by one person, a woman, and, and you know, it was a powerful thing, incredible program. Uh, it was very, very difficult. I have to say it was the most difficult clientele, clientele on, on earth. And, and yet we made this progress. Lots of other firms, uh, Germanifin Geismar, Geismar was very important to this thing, Lippincott and Margulies, um, Pentagram. There were, there were others involved, and incrementally, as I say, they invited more and more firms into it. It really had a power, uh, quite an engine behind it. And uh, so in, in a relatively short period of time, let's say 10 years, most of those agencies you refer to had started or completed a program. And, and what was interesting about Nancy Hanks who was head of the National Endowment for the Arts, was that she sort of had this two-track argument that she uh, seemed to advance on behalf of this program, on behalf of the National, of the Federal Design Improvement Program. One was sort of aesthetic, which you'd expect because, you know, she was head of the NEA and cared about art and beautifying things, quote unquote, right? But the, ar but the real argument that stuck had to do with efficiency and, and, um, and, and modernization. I think there was a sense that the federal government was living in the past that, you know, people uh, hammering away at manual typewriters and everything was just sort of, you know, like pre not, not even like post-World War II, but sort of like somehow lodged at the early part of the 20th century. And somehow if things can be modern, so they look like real corporations, the corporations that were getting contracts from people like NASA, that would kind of advance the credibility of these federal organizations really too. Important yeah, and um, um, uh, she enlisted so many people, up to and including the then president of the United States, Richard Nixon, to put his signature against a mandate that had multi-step things about how the federal government would approve its design efforts, right? So, um, you know, obviously Richard Nixon has a uh, mixed legacy uh, uh, historically, but um, uh, when you yeah when, when you when you read the um, uh, his statements on behalf of the value of design to not just uh, efficiency not just beauty but to serving the the daily needs of human beings and citizens in this country it's really really it's compelling a, and would stand yeah, today yeah. if it was republished and also Richard actually won the presidential design award from and was bestowed to him by President Reagan in 1985 right yeah. and. He, along with I.M. Pei, I mean, there were, he, I mean, it was a big deal to have that accolade and um, also sort of, 
you know, it, it firmed up the belief that the worm really, really had entered into something really extra special in the, in the visual vernacular of NASA and so the world. So brought that up. <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah, why not? It was a, if this is a big day, that was a big day. Yeah. I bet it was. Yeah, meaning with President Reagan, um, uh, who, who, who introduced the, the, the chairman of the whole uh, effort was IMP, as you recognize it. And he introduced him as IMP. <laughs> uh, but it's okay. <laughs> but it's a great day. And, and you think about that. And Michael's right to bring this up. Cost efficiency, even us as designers, we use that term so, you know, it, it, it was almost enough to turn your stomach. Yeah. But efficiency, cost savings, there were examples though, like uh, we, we started on civil service commission redesign. We didn't get past phase one because we st started sticking our noses in the wrong places. Designers, we found out that the same job would have paper ordered three from three different places, big giant paper orders, and then they were shred the two orders rather than send them back. Stuff like this was going on. And uh, you know, so our job, or even with NASA, the, the um, forms project took us a year and a half. And we cut the form. You remember that period where you were simplifying language on insurance forms and things? That's what we were doing. And so we cut them down to about the third of their size with new language and a lot less language and everything. And then the paper costs just plummeted, you know. It's, that's what it was. And you could lead with that ahead of aesthetics. Hmm. The fact that it looked better was kind of frosting on the cake. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Bert, uh, can you talk a little bit about how that, that legacy that was created through all this, um, how that has continued at NASA, how, what you've seen of the design culture at NASA now? I mean, I think we're having definitely a moment right now. I think I started noticing it at NASA around the Curiosity landing that there was this sort of new generation. I mean, I remember from the mission control for Curiosity, there was somebody that was wearing a mohawk. Bobby Ferdozzi, and then, and then somebody was like dressed up as a hippie, and there were all these people, I'm like, what's going on here? This is just too cool. And like, who are these people, and where are they coming from? And all of a sudden, social media was taking off around that time. And honestly, that has done so much for the agency to be able, we have over 380 million followers or something like that in total, but it's, it's very much a force to be able to share our story, and what a wonderful way to share it. People can just open their phones and see what's latest on NASA.gov or on, on, you know, on, on NASA social or, or whatever, and be able to see what's happening, what an astronaut might be taking a picture of, what, um, you know, what, what Earth has, what, what our Earth satellites are unveiling visually, but also our logos, what they represent. And, and I just think that you know, it's all about the beauty of logos that they, 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 they represent more than just an aesthetic, right? They represent the force of nature that's within us all and then also what's in NASA and what it represents. And it also is something to aspire to, I think, on some level. It's, it's, it's a sort of inspirational and aspirational sort of, you know, uh, emblem in some ways, be it the meatball or the worm. I think, though, to flip the script a little bit, it's not just pop you know, pop culture being interested in NASA. NASA's been interested in pop culture and has really capitalized on the moment to take these moments to be part of the conversation and start a dialogue. Most of these collaborations are just the byproduct of a conversation that's happened between a blockbuster movie or an artist or a musician or a Hollywood star because they've made a statement about their desire to go to space or they've written a song about it and there've been really quick responses that your social media team has been able to actually be part of the conversation. That has been a very youthful resurgence. Yeah, and also just generally the entertainment world. I work on the entertainment liaison, and we've seen starting around 2015, 2016 with The Martian, they wanted to use the, the, the worm basically on the suits. They wanted to use the meatball in different ways. We were able to, to, able to use these logos in really fun sort of fictional ways. Mm -hmm. I mean, you had even in, on Transformers movies, what, whatever. I mean, it was just really wonderful. Hidden Figures, for instance, yeah. a wonderful, wonderful movie we worked on. And First Man, another movie about a biopic about Neil Armstrong. These were wonderful engagements that sort of propelled the stories of NASA forward and um, basically helped tell the story and the lore of, of, of the space program as it ages and, and in, sort of in a new way. Yeah, and David said something 
oh, oh, David said something, but then Bert kind of echoed it a moment ago, which is, I think, the key to the whole thing, which is that uh, people, people care about the NASA logo because they care about NASA, mm -hmm. yeah. right? It's, I mean, it, like, people don't, it's people, yeah. human beings don't have a, an affinity to, like, shapes and lines and mm -hmm. stuff. It's just those are empty symbols unless they're standing for something, symbolizing something. And in this case, what they symbolize is so powerful and so compelling, and this becomes a conduit for that um, passion that it engenders in people. Yeah, and that's, that's a lovely point as well. Can, can we dive a little bit deeper into that then? Um, how do you think the, the visual identities here um, like, how do they go about representing that, that really incredible mission? I mean, the, the meatball, I mean, if you look at the logos themselves, the meatball does it more, you know, literally, because you have, like, stars and an orbit and a vector, and there's, like, all these sort of symbols for different elements. The, the worm, in a much more subtle, sort of elegant way, also sort of inhabits the world of space flight as well, and movement actually, I think in a lot of ways with, with the S attached to the A and you sort of have this feeling of movement, yeah, right? It's, it's, I mean, I know you guys are the designers, I but, mean, it's, it's, but. I mean, it's interesting. I think that uh, uh, David and his team orchestrated a very elegant reconciliation between these two logos, in my opinion. Um, you know, and I'm gonna, I'm going to give the meatball a little due. I'm on the record of saying, somewhere, if you, if you Google me and this subject, you'll find me saying that the meatball is a terrible, terrible, terrible logo. And I, I've revised my thinking about it since then. And I think part of it has to do with the fact that if you understand the culture that it represents, it comes out of um, the, the culture of, of um, group um, uh, you know, of, of, um, of, of, of a spree de corps, of a group of people that are coming together to complete a mission. And if you look up and down, particularly the world of, you know, the Air Force and the branches of the military, you find that on every, every level. And I think to a large degree, um, NASA and its predecessor agency were, you know, was an outgrowth of that culture. And so the idea that that insignia as a patch kind of represents, you know, kind of um, an allegiance to to you, your colleagues, and to the mission you're serving is really important. But I think that um, if you kind of look at the other side of what NASA specifically does, which is an engineering-led operation, you think back on um, uh, you know, that amazing scene in Apollo 13 where they're improvising, this, you know, they're trying to figure out how to uh, turn the thing back on without kind of blowing the fuse. Or I'm, I'm not saying that accurately because I'm not an engineer. <laughs> but, um, but like it has to do with, with, um, with um, minimal means. You know, how can we actually achieve our goal using the least amount of power, the least amount of weight, the least amount of everything. And then you sort of like see that argues for this sort of reductive simplicity, I think. So you sort of have on one hand the meatball representing kind of the, um, you know, the, the, ebullience of, uh, the ebullience of sort of like just kind of everyone kind of coming together to kind of create something. But then sort of the idea that the thing that actually propels it forward and the, the, the world that that lives in is represented, I think, by, um, by the 1975 logo. You know? So I think the, um, the, the, and the way that they're staged on aircraft and in other things actually pays that out. You put the insignia up close to the crew, and then this thing is sort of by the engine in a way. I think it really is very elegantly balanced. Do you know what else is really cool? The fact that we actually have something called the meatball and something <laughs> called the worm. <laughs> I mean, that's just crazy. Yeah, yeah. I mean, isn't it crazy? I mean, it's like nuts. I mean, why is it called the meatball? I don't know. I, I, I don't know. It's just well, it's round. The worm, <laughs> the worm <laughs> I understand. It's sort you, of descriptive. You never called it the worm. I mean, did you, I never, when you no, and Bruce were working, you called, called it this logo worm type. thing. I know you'll find that strange, but <laughs> I never call it the worm. I can say it now. <laughs> and it's a term of endearment now. So it, it used to be, uh, you know, there's the Fort Lauderdale paper that came up with that term, derogatory, of course. And then it became a term of endearment as meatball does. So anyway, what he just said, I didn't pay him to say that. <laughs> but that's exactly what we were about in those days. And uh, it was a flyboy, flyboy culture. Yeah. You know, we yeah. called it Buck Rogers then. Yeah. You, you, you call it, um, uh, you know, it's a space thing now. Yeah, you know? yeah. So, uh, but, but that's, and we were trying to take you in the, into the future, but with the simplest of means. By the way, the printing in those days was so atrocious from GPO. But when you said you're on record online, I know that's true. 
<laughs> he speaks the truth. And, uh, you know, so our, the simplicity was, was obvious as propulsion and technology and all that sort of movement. Um, but we were also trying to make it useful so that you couldn't destroy it in printing. We also wanted to put it on the front covers of everything and on signing and on markets. And we found the meatball was always on the back cover of the stuff that existed as if it was embarrassing. Uh, it was partly because it couldn't be reproduced in those days. They've overcome a lot of that now. So you're yeah, okay and more there's more on, a, on the web. So that took care of itself. But Michael explained it very well that, uh, and reached that point in time where we needed to demonstrate that, that this space stuff wasn't just for, for jet jockeys and flyboys, but it was to getting science, this brilliant science out there down to earth and paying your own way, that cost efficiency was still very much alive. And that's, uh, that's, that's what this was about. So it was a STEM word often, NASA news, NASA activities, you know, and, and uh, of course in helvetical light, as you, you noticed. <laughs> So anyway, that's, that's the kind of thing. It helps to understand, I think, the environment of that time. And it wasn't just, uh, it was a real movement, as you addressed earlier. Why did this happen? Uh, you know, it didn't all stick. I've been disappointed to go, but, but I, was, I was looking at DOT FAA the other day, and there was the plane still designed, beautiful things. Speaking of cost saving, <laughs> they were really good looking and they still are, and it cost about a third less to paint them with our scheme that had to <laughs> Go figure. Uh, so we're getting to the end of our time here on our panel. Um, I would love to end with just one final quick question for Richard. Um, no. Now that the, the worm is back, kind of what do you hope its, its final legacy will be as we move into the future? To, to, to the use of the logo uh, going forward? Uh, yeah, what, what you hope it will represent in, in NASA going forward. Well, I, I think, and this is, this is borrowing f somewhat from what we're gonna say out at the, uh, the 3D installation. Um, I think it's useful for the foreseeable future, you know, very long term. I don't see that changing. One of, the, one of my design colleagues, a very noted guy, uh, said the other day on the internet, and I'm quoting now, he said, that logo is so damn good, it's good, it's good for another 50 years. <laughs> and uh, so my hope would be that it'll be useful for uh, the foreseeable future and that it can, can help power the, uh, the great programs of NASA that are coming up. All right, amazing. Well, thank you all so much for being here today, and thank you to our incredible panelists. Fantastic, fantastic panel. It was really interesting to hear all your individual stories and how together they tell the story of our worm uh, from creation uh, to its cultural significance today. So thank you again. Thank you, Richard, obviously, for creating and designing it and also for being part of this panel along with Michael, uh, Bert, Julia, and Shelley for moderating. Also, thank you to David and, and Mark who gave some remarks before that. So for those of you here at NASA headquarters, we invite you to continue celebrating with us. Join us outside at 1240 for us dedicating the wor uh, worm sculpture that's uh, right outside the agency's new Earth Information Center, which just opened this summer. For those watching us on television, thank you so much for joining us. We hope this event deepens your appreciation of our worm uh, as a symbol of NASA's history, but also our future. Have a great day.